Dan said we've had three weeks of this, and um, if you could dim the lights a little bit, it would be nice. And the first week we looked at uh, real love and real sin, and we, and we sort of touched on baptism and, and, and the kind of total, complete package of baptism, not just the water, but the infilling and, and the Holy Spirit and the, and the total uh, immersion of what it is to be filled with the Spirit. Then last week we sort of looked at uh, the comfort and the wealth of the West and is that really going to gonna sort of uh, hold us back? You know, it, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, uh, needle for a, than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And we looked at belief versus unbelief, how, how you can have this kind of tension where, where um, the man with the uh, demon-possessed son, he says, I believe, I believe, but help me, help me in my unbelief. And tonight, as we come to an end of this, real has to be radical. We read that Jesus was radical. The message of Jesus, it's lasted 2,000 years. The Bible the, is the most popular book, I'm told. It's, it's got the biggest selling book year after year after year. There's something incredibly radical about Jesus. It's something that we, can, we need to grab hold of. It's seen as, as new revelation to unbelievers. It's seen as foundational for believers. It's seen as life-changing. It's, it's a blueprint. It's a, the very foundation of life. It answers the question, the whys, the wheres, the hows, and, and the wherefores of life. And it uh, holds the truth for today. It, it's relevant for every century. It's, it's relevant for every new generation. And, and the Bible holds the keys to everything about life. But do we really hear it like that? Do we really grab it like that? Do we see the radicalness, the excitement of the Bible? Jesus answers every question of society, right through to the, through the elite, the, the religious leaders, right down to the sinner and the shamed and the outcast when Jesus sits down and has a meal with him. This message survives because it's radical. It's incredible. There's nothing boring. There's nothing old-fashioned. There's nothing traditional about the message of Jesus. And if it is, if it's seen that way, it's not Jesus' fault. It's not God's fault. And it's certainly not the Holy Spirit's fault, is it? Where does the blame lie? It's us, isn't it? If we're boring and traditional, if we aren't taking the word of God so seriously, and you know, as we hear, the packaging has to change but the message remains the same. This good news story, it's eye-opening, mind-blowing, incredibly life-changing, exciting stuff. Yeah, Bernie smiles over there. We have a little bit of excitement in the building. You know, last year we had the Baptist Hui here, and Craig's mentioned it, and Alvey's mentioned it. We had a guy, Erwin McManus, come and speak from Mosaic Church in LA, I think it is. And he told us a story about how Easter, or not, perhaps not just Easter, here's a lot of atheists comes, comes to his church. One Easter, they had a thousand atheists at church. That's right, a thousand atheists. Now just get your head around that, right? Church service, a thousand atheists turn up. And he said, you know why they turn up? Because they like the stories of Jesus. They like the values and, and perhaps some of the morals, but the teaching of Jesus. Now, they're not necessarily all going to come to faith, but there's something inspiring and relevant for the atheists. They like hearing the stories of Jesus. We've got a book in, in our library out there said, called There is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Found God, written by Jonathan Flew. How the world's most notorious atheist found God. Isn't that startling and stunning? You know, radical's a great term. Young people grab hold of it. And I, I just like to see young people in the church and the excitement they bring. And, 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 and you know, they'll, they'll start a radical movement or a new move or something exciting. And, and they'll build on it and, and people will flock to it. And it's great. It's good news. And, and you build this community of faith and people. And then soon it becomes church and slightly less radical. You know, radicals born out of, out of boredom for the status quo. Radicals the opposite to, to we've always done it that way. Radical draws people into real faith 
Radical is good. Jesus is good. He came to turn the whole religious world upside down. And look at Paul. He's beaten. He's stoned. He's thrown in prison because he believes in the authentic Christian message to be heard, to be, to be explained. His life, his safety, everything's put on the line and his future has no concern for him. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Really? Honestly, when we read that, what does it do to us? Do we read that message? Do we grab it? Do we say, real equals radical? You know, as soon as we do that, we're faced with this question, what's important? What's unimportant? Jesus came to make waves, to buck society. He's, he's radically baptized. He's radically tempted. He's taken out into the desert to temptation. You know, real Christianity, it's recognized and it's overcoming temptation because at some point every day we're all tempted and getting through each day, it's about living amongst the temptations of this world that come up against us physically, emotionally, spiritually, there's always going to be a temptation. And when we study or we go to our schools or universities, our workplaces, the world, there's always a tempt, temptation there. It's my right. I deserve it. I've worked hard for it. Then when we come home, the advertising tells us that I want it. I deserve it. I'm entitled to it. It's mine. I deserve it. Look good, feel good. You know, real Christianity is about facing the temptations of the world. Think about the attitude you have to something, something that's attractive, something that you want, something that you feel you deserve. Real faith is asking the question, is this going to build? Is it going to enhance? Is it going to help? Develop my Christian walk, my Christian attitude. Try asking the question. Challenge yourself. It's not just about things. It's not, not just about objects. It's about attitudes. It's about thought patterns. We're tempted by the attractions and modes and methods of this world. You know, look around this past year. What, what's happened? What's happened in the world that has either denigrated the Christian message or actually totally disrespected what the Bible stands for. And we're, soon we're conditioned in society to say, hey, that's okay, and, and, and not to question what's happening. You know, every so often that blatant controversy arises, like, like in America, let's get prayer out of the schools. Let's get prayer out of parliament. And, you know, before long it'll be get rid of our national anthem, get rid of God defend New Zealand. Get Christ out of Christmas. Let's celebrate happy holidays. You know, real faith is, is what do we do with, and how do we live? How do we act? How do we behave as Christians? You know, are the attractions of this world more important? Do the attractions of this world have more persuasion over me than the Bible? Am I really that, that different? I'm gonna, we're going to show a clip now. It's from Amazing Grace. And it's where Wilbur... William Wilberforce is speaking with John Newton in, in the chapel in the church. John Newton wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. And uh, it, it's, it's pretty interesting, sad, sadly interesting. John Newton was the captain of the slave ships. And he talks early and not in this one about, uh, he, he comes to a radical conversion. He's sort of in the church. And he talks about 20,000 spirits haunting him. And, and that's a case of um, the 20,000 slaves that he actually... Um, brought, you know, brought uh, on the slave ships. Really awful. You can tell this guy has, has a shrill dilemma of life. And then John Newton goes to see him. Can we show it now? With, whoa, turn the lights down. The beggar at the door assures me that I'm now old enough to call you John. Dressing very simply these days. I'm a simple man. I try to pretend I am a monk, but I don't have the willpower. I'm a monk, Mondays, Wednesdays. You know what I read your name in the papers doing 
these great things. I still see a tiny boy with his hair a mess and ink on his fingers. So, what do you want with your old preacher? I'm here to seek your advice. When you were a child, you used to ask God for advice. Then I grew up and grew foolish. And now? Now, slowly my faith is returning. How slowly? No bolts of lightning. Yeah. God sometimes does his work with gentle drizzle, not storms. Trip, trip, trip. My friend William Pitt has declared an interest in me. William who? He's offering me a place in the world. Just make sure you're in the world, not of the world. There would be no escape from power once I have it. I would have to see things through. So why wouldn't you? Are you contemplating a life of solitude? Wilbur, well, you have work to do. Besides, people like you too much to let you live a life of solitude. Haven't you chosen solitude? You of all people should know I can never be alone. There now. There now what? The other reason I came. You told me that you live in the company of 20,000 ghosts, the ghosts of slaves. I was explaining to a child why a grown man cowers in a dark corner. I need you to tell me about them. I'm not strong enough to hear my own confession. I thought time might have changed you. It has. I'm older. Pitt has asked me to take them on. The slavers. I'm the last person you should come to for advice. I can't even say the name of any of my ships without being back on board them in my head. All I know is 20,000 slaves live with me in this little church. There's still blood on my hands. Will you help me, John? I can't help you. But do it, Wilbur. Do it. Take them on. Blow their dirty, filthy ships out of the water. The planters, sugar barons, Haldeman Sugarcane, the Lord Mayor of London, Liverpool, Boston, Bristol, New York, all their streets running with blood, dysentery, puke. You won't come away from those streets clean, Wilbur. You'll get filthy with it, you'll dream it, see it in broad daylight, but do it, for God's sake. Be in the world, not of the world. Do it, Wilbur, do it. Take them on. You'll get filthy with it. Dream it. You'll not come away clean, but do it, Wilbur. Do it. Pretty amazing story, isn't it? It's to be radical as Jesus was radical. He, he picked corn. He healed people on the Sabbath. And through all of this, Jesus is saying, there's something new coming. But wait, there's something new. The old is gone. The new is coming and Jesus says, I'm coming, I will forgive, I will cleanse, I will make you whiter than snow, I will clean up your past. There is a new way to live, and I think for all of us who are followers of Jesus, we need to get to that place where there's something new, there's something exciting, there's something radical. In Mark it says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And you know what that's about in those days? The, the old wineskin would get brittle, 
and, and uh, crack up and it can't expand. And, and some of them would hold 60 gallons of wine, very good vintage. And uh, you stick a patch on and if it build, you know, blows apart, you lose all that really good quality of wine. So you can't do that. You can't stick something old, uh, something new on the old. And, and we've got to be careful we don't get bogged down with the old when God is wanting us to do something new. You know, I, I can remember when I first got into the church about 34 years ago, I had absolutely no church background. But in those days, it was fresh. It was exciting. It, it was new. And, and God was, was doing something. And, and people were, were coming along each week excited, expecting it. And they'd take a risk. They'd go forward. They'd ask for prayer. No one wanted to miss out what was happening because we were looking to the new. And if you didn't come Sunday morning, you, you raced there to be there on Sunday night because what was happening? And, you know, the old is important, but we cannot be stuck back there wanting to do the same old thing year after year because it's, it's safer. Authentic, real Christianity is looking for something new. What's new God doing to me personally? What's God saying to me? What's he saying to the congregation or the, or the churches of New Zealand? But it's sometimes we need to slow down and we need to hear. Take time. What is God saying to me? And it's, it's, it's okay to look back, but not to get stuck back there. You know, I'm convinced that God is always challenging us, challenging us to look to the new in our Christian walk. You know, really? Is that what, how we think? Or are we going to be sitting in the same seat next year asking the same questions? Where is God? Or what's God's plan for my life? Or do we look for the new and grab hold of the new? You know, Jesus speaks in the, in the synagogue. Everyone is amazed at his teaching. The next chapter, he's sitting down, having a meal with the sinful and the downcast. You know, there is room for everyone to live out our dream and, and desires and plans and wishes for what God has for us. We don't have to be, be stuck in the past. We, we're not a product of the past. And, and, and when Sue and I got into Christianity a couple of years later, we ended up in Christchurch, and we lived with the family, and, and uh, we lived with them for three months. We had three children. They had six children, and it was kind of a tiny little house, but we ended up living with them. And, and I, I, I say that's the best Bible school, Bible college I ever went to because the bloke, Nick, he was, uh, he was just a down, real, real basic Christian man who loved his wife. He loved his family, and he loved his faith, and it's what I needed to learn and then you, you ask him about his faith. And he came to faith by sitting in a motel room in Australia reading the Bible. And he came to faith. And his background was awful. His, his father was an alcoholic and a drunkard. So he'd had a really hard upbringing. But none of that reflected on the new life that he had in Christ. And right to you know, the end of his father's life, he, they even had the, his father living at home with him till he died. But, look, but Nick had this new life in Christ. The old never affected his family. He's raised his children in, in a great, strong uh, Christian home. But, you know, let's not pretend that we can just fit the new on the old. It doesn't fit like that. But we need to follow a dream and go forward with the new and don't get stuck in the past and hanker for the past. You know, Sue and I have, we were talking the other day over our sort of life, we've moved seven or eight times over the past 34 years. And, and, and as I said, we're in Christchurch with our family. We we're praying. And one night I went to church and God said, leave your security and safety. So I went home and Sue was okay and I left my job. We had three kids and a mortgage. We ended up at Totra Springs. We were there for two years. And then I felt the challenge that I want to go to Bible college and learn something. Just not having a church background, you want to learn something. So I went up to Auckland, to Lincoln Road. It was called Bible College in those days. Now it's Laidlaw College. And I went there for a year to study. And after the year, I threw it in and said, I'm no student. I've got no brains. It's too hard. The college was good. I was just no good. So I gave up the study. And we worked out West Auckland. Then three years later, a pastor knocks on the door and he says, what's God saying to you? And I said, oh, I was in the Air Force. One day I might be a chaplain in the Air Force. He said, well, you've got to go and... Go to Baptist College, but don't go this year, go next year. So we didn't hear from him for 12 months. Then he, again, he turns up on our door, he knocks on the door. 
He says, it's time to go to college. I said, no way, I've got four kids, it's a mortgage, it's too expensive, it's too hard, and I've got no brains. And he said, oh, the church will pay your fees. Perhaps God's talking to us, I said. <laughs> so he went to college, and Craig was there. He didn't even help me with my theology. I failed theology. <laughs> so I had to reset theology. So it took me a bit longer than normal people to get through college. So I went to Whangamata. Then after five years at Whangamata, you know, God challenges us about this chaplaincy thing. So we had an interview with the, the head chaplain for the Air Force. We had an interview, and after the interview, Sue and I looked at ourselves and said, there's no way we're joining that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to the Air Force as a chaplain. They're all crazy. I'm just not interested. I don't want to do it. And we'd been talking to Craig. We came down here. We had an interview with, this was about year 2000, with Bethlehem Baptist Church. Bethlehem Baptist Church said, yes, you can come and work here next year. I said, okay, that's fine. Six months later, we're in, I'm in the Air Force as a chaplain. God led us back there, even though I didn't want to go. We did that for seven years, and then seven years later, we ended up here at Bethlehem Baptist Church. But there's always something new. There's always something fresh. There's always something radical and different. And, and you know, yeah, th there is some kind of cost. There is something that's different, something that's difficult. But, you know, God is bigger than my excuses. God is bigger than, than my ifs and my buts and my maybes. Authentic Christianity is God is real. God is first. And it's looking for the new. It's not trying to mix the old with the new. It's not trying to go back to the safety and the security of the old. You know, when I, when I first got out of the Air Force, I had no job, and uh, I could go and work at Totra Springs. Malcolm Barrow offered us a job, go and work in this faith job. And uh, up until that point, there was a job in Auckland. And it was almost like God was saying to me, you can have this job in Auckland, you can have the security and the money that you've just left behind, or you can start the faith journey. It was, it, was, it was incredible. It all came together exactly the same time. And, and God gave me everything I wanted. He, he, I could have had security and safety with a job in Auckland. And I always wanted a job with a car, and that job had a car. And still I went to Totra Springs. But God knows where we are. And, and that's why I kind of like to see, you know, the church that we have and the young people thinking ahead and something new happening. And, and you know, one of the neat things about our church here, we're, we have two incredible people in our church uh, one of them is here tonight, you know, John Douglas and Jim Hearn. You know, John Douglas is a man in his senior years, been retired for a while, but everything is new. He's done his PhD in spiritual formation. Last year, he was the, the president of the Baptist Union, going around helping churches, advising churches, talking to churches. This year, he's the chairman of hospital chaplaincy for New Zealand again, which is is not an easy job. But, but John and, and his wife Dorothy, they, they don't get stuck back there. They keep moving forward. There's something new in their faith. And we all know Jim Hearn now, he, in his 80s, who seven months ago was, was preaching. And, and you go and visit him now, he's frail and he's ill. But he's got another sermon. You, I talked to him the other week and he's pulling out his Bible and he's underlining it. And I want to preach this. I want to preach this. It's exciting. People need to hear this. But these people have moved forward. They haven't, they haven't got stuck back there. And, and you know, in their senior years, they, they're still moving forward with the, with the excitement of what it is to, to be a follower of Jesus. Something radical. Way to go, John. Keep smiling, John. You know, you've got to respect the past and treat the, the past with, with, with the, uh, the due respect it, it desires. But let's not get stuck back there. Let's not just try and stick a new patch on and say, okay, we've made it. We've kind of fixed it all up. But let's look for the new, the radical that God is doing. And, you know, I mentioned the other week about um, Holy Trinity Brompton and um, where Alpha come from, where they've said to the, uh, the, London, the Anglican hierarchy in England, don't close another church, don't close another church. And they have replanted 10 churches that I counted on their webpage. People just giving up everything, packing up, moving, jobs, families, everything, just moving and re, replanting, bringing these churches alive. And, and I was reading the other week about Henri Now, and um, Melissa spoke about him last year in, in the book he wrote, The, the Prod Prodigal Son, The Painting. And, um, you know, this man, this great Catholic man of prayer and, and speaking and teaching for many years, he spent the, the last few years of his life 
serving um, and looking after adults with intellectual and physical disabilities, cleaning, feeding, helping, just absolutely serving them. And, you know, God, not that we all have to do that, but this exciting plan that God has for all of our lives. When we go looking for it, a guy by the name of Robert Morrison, 18... 1807, he, went, he was the first Protestant missionary to China. And um, he was there for 27 years. He had one trip home. He died. He died there after 27 years. Ten Chinese came to faith in that time. He translated the Bible into Chinese. He wrote a Chinese dictionary, hymn books, and prayer books. Ten, 27 years, ten people came to faith. These days, there's somewhere between 15 to 50 million Chinese. He didn't see that great stuff, did he, that great growth, but he followed God. He did what he was called to do. And the other week, I was reading about Smith Wigglesworth, this radical guy in the 1800s. And uh, if you read what, how he prayed and people were healed, you'd cringe at some of the methods that he used, how God used him. But, but it was new for the time. He was obedient to God. And one of the stories was that the family asked Wigglesworth to, to come and pray for their gravely ill son. So uh, he arrived on their doorstep and they said, oh, oh Smith, you're too late. He's just about dead. He's just about had it. And Smith said, God never gets me to a place where it's too late. It's never too late. So he said, oh, by the way, I've got another meeting I have to go to, but I will be back. Can you please just lay out some clothes, the boy's clothes on the bed? But I'll be back. God will heal him. He came back a couple of years later, a couple of hours later, a couple of hours later, and, uh, and the parents hadn't put the clothes on the bed. You, know, you can imagine what he said. And he said, put the clothes on the bed. And he said to the boy, he said, when I place my hands on you, the glory of the Lord will fill this place. And at the moment he, he touched and, and prayed for the boy, the boy was totally healed. There's radical stuff out there, you know, radical stuff. Matthew 6 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I said on the first night here, what did our yes to baptism really mean? When we got baptized all those years ago, months ago, or perhaps weeks ago, what did that yes really mean? If God's word really is sharper than a two-edged sword, how does that really influence us today? Where is God in is this, all of this? Who is our master? You know, I'm always amazed at, at the Jews when, when Moses led them out of, of the clutches of Egypt and the, and the cruelty and the torment. In 40 years, he provided for them. He, he led them by fire and by cloud. And then they grumbled and moaned. What's all that about? And then Moses goes up the mountain. And what happens when he's up the mountain? Oh, we've got to build a, a golden calf. It's safe and secure. And they build this golden calf. Isn't that so typical of us as, as humans? The good old days, the safe days, disregard God. Let's go back. Let's be safe and secure. Take away our life and faith and trust. Let's go for the safe and the secure. Let's worship the gold, golden calf. You know, Real Christianity is about movement. And one of the things I like to say is that the church should be up with society, not playing catch-up. So often, you know, we're five or ten years behind society and we're trying to catch up and meet society. I really think, you know, the church should be up with society and leading, leading society in, in whatever way we can. And, and I think one of the neat things we, we see here is our, our youth work and our children and, and people wanting to bring their children and their youth here because, you know, raising teenagers these days, it's just so hard and so difficult. And, you know, you come here on a Wednesday night and there's 150 young people worshipping, praising God, being taught good stuff. And, you know, I think that's tremendous. The church should be out there leading society to be ra radical, to be real, to be re relevant. Because if we're not, the devil has his way. The devil gets control in leading and influencing you know, Jesus was, was radical. He ripped into the leaders. He healed on the Sabbath. He broke the, the rules and the laws. He was accused of being a drunkard, mixing with sinners and prostitutes. 
He overturned uh, the tables. He made bold statements. You'll only get to heaven through me. There's only one way to God's kingdom. He says, if you want to follow me, there's going to be a cost. You're going to have to give some stuff up. He says, turn your back on the family. Turn your back on everything you hold safe and secure. He goes up to the local pig farm and he, send, he sends the whole of the pig farm's pigs over the cliff and walks away. How bad is that? He walks away from it. You see, do you get the picture? There's something exciting in our Christianity. There's something relevant in our faith. At some point, the talking has to stop and the words have to stop. And we have to each individually get on our knees and say, God, God, where, where are you? What are you doing? Where, where next? What, what's happening in my life? And, you know, not everyone has to go and go all around the world or go to college and that, but it's just putting God first, taking the time and the quietness to find God, to slow down enough to find God. Someone told me the other day about God TV. I guess you all know about God TV. You can watch God on TV 24 hours a day. Monica does that, eh, Monica? <laughs> that American stuff. This is channel, man. You can watch everything about God 24 hours a day. You can watch all the sermons, all the, all the religious podcasts you can get hold of. It's just at your fingertips. Sit back in the lazy boy, swing back, watch it all. But it's not going to move you, is it? It's not going to be, draw you to radical Christianity. You actually have to do something. You cannot pretend to, to place a, a new patch on an old way of thinking. You're gonna, you cannot keep the safety and security of the past and, the, and flick it into the present. At the same time, trying to attach new thinking to our ministry. You know, the safeguards of yesterday need to be put aside and, and God needs to be given permission to take us on a journey. That's the excitement of it. You know, without trailing all the past, the past is important and, and we have to respect the past. And, and, and some of us are hurt from the past and... And I'm certainly not going to minimize the past and the sadness and the hurts of the past. But they cannot identify us. We cannot be tracked by, their, by that, by what happened in the past. The point is that, you know, nothing's wasted. Nothing's wasted. Wherever we've come from, whatever we've been, to, been through, God has been with us. The whole step and, and the sadness and the grief and all of that, nothing is ever wasted. But sometimes we have to let that go and move forward and faith, and confidence in God, and, and, and just, yeah, just, probably radical's a bit strong, so I apologize for that if it's, if it's a bit strong. <laughs> Let's be mediocre. <laughs> Let's be real and mediocre for God. Is, it, oh, is that okay? We'll be real and a little bit mediocre. <laughs> but anyway, you know, let's, Let's just be, be excited about our faith. God's mercies are new every morning. And, and we have this, this, our faith is amazing. It's incredible. And, uh, you know, I just love that clip from Amazing Grace. Just do it. Just do it. It's going to be filthy. It's going to be unclean. It's going to be hard. And it's coming from John Newton, who, who lives with these 20,000 ghosts and this torment in his life. But he's saying to, oh, Will before. And if you, you've all seen the movie, I think it kills him in the end, doesn't it? It's, you know, going through Parliament and all that, I think he eventually dies, but he gets his, his bill through. Just do it, Wilbur. The filth and the grime, just get out there and do it. Okay, let's, let's close it there and we'll, we'll sing. We'll finish, finish with this song. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, for the privilege of knowing you and loving you, Lord. Father, the privilege of bowing down before you and worshipping you and saying, you are indeed the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father God, Lord, you are our, our God. You are our King. And Father, Lord, we, we surrender everything. We surrender the past, the present, the future to you, Almighty God. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, Lord, we send to the, surrender the past pain. Lord, the pain that holds us back. Lord, we surrender that to you and we give that to you, Lord. And Father, we know, Almighty God, that you are big enough to take the past and, and wipe it clean, wipe it away, Lord. And Lord, lead us into the new, into the future, into the radical future, Lord. Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Lord, you love us too much to give us and allow us to be a mediocre Christian, Lord. Father, we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.